thousand stories of what they think you like, but I've a tender whisper left in the dead of night. And he tells that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Who is he? You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. When I many searching for him. But I know that we're all searching for answers. Only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm living. It's who I am. It's who I am. Let's sing it again. You're, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. Yes, it's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. As we were singing the second line of the first verse, it says, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased with me and that I'm never alone. I just, as I was singing that, I even felt like, man, I feel like maybe someone needs to hear that today. But even though I make mistakes and even though I falter and even though the, the chasm is wide that we sang about in that first song, the heavenly father who loves you, loves you because he loves you, not because you're perfect or you put on a good show or 
frankly, even because you're standing in this room today, he's, he doesn't love you more. He loves you endlessly. Even when you're at your darkest, even when you're at your most broken, it says that he stands at the door and knocks. And he is saying, I love you. I'm for you. He is a good father. So Lord, we want to thank you for that truth today. We want to thank you that even when we feel alone, Lord, even when we feel like we have messed up for the thousandth time in what we've said or what we've done, because of your son, Jesus' blood washed over us, you are pleased and we are not alone. You are with us and we thank you for that today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, take a moment and say hello to those around you and then you can take a seat. Well, again, good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here in One Harbor and it's so good to have you with us today. Hey, we have a, a real heart and desire as a church and as a people to continually push back on the darkness of addiction in our area. And that's something that you're going to hear us talk about a lot because there is a lot of brokenness in that area. And so um, there's a gentleman right here in the front row with a Beaufort shirt on named Guy Manning. Guy, will you stand up real quick? We wanted to recognize Guy because he has just completed the program at Hope Mission. And, man, we are so proud of you. But what I heard just even in brief was you showed up and you were not in a good way uh, at the beginning of this program. And God has done some amazing things in bringing you this far. So we're so proud of you. Well done. Can we give him a round of applause? Hey, we know that coming to a new church, if you're new with us, we're so glad that you've joined us today. There are so many great churches in our area, and that you've chosen to be with us today is a real honor. We know that coming to a new church can be really, really intimidating and um, probably even give you a bunch of reason to ask some questions like, well, why do they do that, and why is the music not loud enough, or, you know, all those questions we typically get. And um, so we, <laughs> we'll get there, you know, we'll get louder. Um, but basically, we, we want to make room for those of you who are new here at One Harbor to, to learn more about some of those things and also meet some of our leaders, hear about our vision as a church to fill East and North Carolina with uh, the gospel. And so we have a First Steps Night coming up on the 21st of this month. Do we have that graphic, guys? First Steps Night. It's going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, that'll be in the lobby right here in Moorhead. And um, like I said, it'll just be a great night to, to meet some people. Child care is provided. Bojangles is provided, which is, that's an important feature of this night, fried chicken. Um, if you want to attend that, just go on the app uh, or the One Harbor webpage, uh, oneharborchurch.com. Go to the events page and just register for that event. We'll make sure that we have child care for you if you need it. And then lastly, for the youth that are in the room, uh, next Sunday night, we're going to be at Battleworks. They're, they're going to be taking out whatever aggression they may have after a really hard year on each other with lasers. Uh, so they're playing laser tag. It's going to be a really, really fun night. So this is for our uh, our high schoolers. Um, you can register on the app and the website as well. It's 20 bucks. And hey, if you can't swing the, the money or whatever, there's a little uh, button there that kind of says, you know, pay later. We'll, we'll handle that. We want to we make sure that if you're a student and you want to be there that night, that you can be there. So we'd love to see you there. Lastly, the reason why you're seeing me so much this morning is Brian and Donnie uh, are in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan, uh, in Kurdistan, in Erbil, and we have the great privilege as, as a church of partnering with churches all around the world. And sometimes those folks will come here maybe to be encouraged, and then we get the privilege sometimes also to go there. And so Donnie and Brian are there with some friends of ours who are planting churches all around Iraq. It's an, a pretty incredible thing. They wanted to give us an update. So will you turn your attention to the screen, and they're going to fill us in. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's uh, Donnie and Brian here. Uh, we're in Erbil, which is in Kurdistan, also known as northern Iraq. And uh, we got here last night, took about... 37 hours, I think, uh, to get here, so long trip. Uh, ended with a customs guy um, at the security in our beal at like 4.30 in the morning. One of the bags got tagged because we brought over a bunch of food for our friends here, and he asked if there was a gun in there, and then he, he was just joking. You know, just a little irony to have that be a joke, so definitely no gun in the bag, but um, yeah, got some sleep, and we're out this morning seeing the city, and just want to invite you guys to pray for us in our time here. Um, yeah, I think just one thing would just be 
that we would gen just be general encouragement, um, that God would help us to encourage uh, these dear mm -hmm. brothers and sisters um, here, um, and that we would just have words to say, and um, and that, that we would be encouraged as well. Uh, but then there's some more specific stuff we can pray into. So, yeah, this morning I uh, met a family, and they're essentially fostering a, a little girl whose mother was uh, taken by ISIS, and she lived in a camp for years. Uh, this little girl, her dad was an ISIS fighter who's been killed. Um, and it was like, it just sobered me up very quickly to how much trauma there is for lots of people, for all the things that have happened in this region, all the conflict. Um, and it, it affects a lot of people. Um, so that's something to certainly be praying into is just that those, yeah, the wounds that are created by that kind of trauma would create openness to the gospel. Yeah, I think like anywhere, like where we live, um, everywhere is, you know, it's beautiful, but it's also broken. And we've just been amazed by the beauty already. People have been so kind to us and people going out of their way to be kind to us. Um, but then there's this, like Brian said, this real undertone of brokenness and sadness that the gospel alone can help. And so pray for our friends here. They want to see, they don't need to see this, this city impacted. They want to see this, the whole Muslim world impacted. So um, pray for those things. Pray for us to be an encouragement and us to be encouraged. Pray for the specific people who've gone through so much trauma. And, and then pray that, that God would, would allow them to get the gospel out all over the Muslim world. We love you guys. Amen. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and, and pray for them. I'll lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you for what you're doing in the world. We thank you for men and women who will lead house churches and will love you and serve your people in some of the darkest places on the planet. Only you can do that, Lord. Only you can change a human heart and cause people to love you. And we thank you that Donnie and Brian have been able to go there. God, I pray that there would be such a divine connection that you would strengthen our team and their team. Father, we thank you for protection on innocent lives. Lord, I pray that your church, like it has through 2,000 years of church history, would prosper in the darkest times. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Jesus, you said you would build your church and hell wouldn't be able to resist it. And for that, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, my name is Fricky. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's an absolute delight to be able to share the Bible with you. Uh, we have just started last week a series called Jesus is Greater, and it's from the book of Hebrews, which we think was actually a sermon, but we'll just call it a book because that's my habit. And um, and. We're going to talk today about Jesus is our greater brother savior. Jesus is our greater brother savior. Now, um, just in terms of this uh, sermon or this book, uh, the author is unknown, but we know that he did know the apostles or she, we're not sure if it's he or she. And uh, we also know that the uh, author assumes that his audience or her audience knows the Old Testament scriptures. And also, we know that uh, his audience had suffered persecution and some of them had either walked away from church and Jesus or were, were contemplating it. And so um, the book starts uh, with this, almost like this encouragement warning um, and, and, it's, and it says something like this, Jesus is the final word of God to us. He is greater than uh, angels who appeared to people in the Old Testament. He's greater than the messengers of the Old Testament. He is 
the final messenger. So make sure you're listening. Are you listening? And then there's this added like, and don't get distracted. Don't take your eyes off of him. And in chapter one, which was dealt with last week, it's online. Um, we have the resume of Jesus, which is absolutely mind-blowing. Now, uh, the, the book of Hebrews is filled with these pictures of Jesus is greater, and it's speckled with these warnings. So we've had the first warning, don't get distracted. If the Old Testament messengers had to be taken seriously, you better take Jesus seriously. So uh, 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 we have that, that warning. We're working our way towards a second warning, and we will see that at the beginning of next Sunday. And the second warning goes something like this. Do not harden your hearts and become discouraged like the children of Israel in the wilderness, where they began to believe they were all alone. And God had left them. And this is, our sermon today is sandwiched between those two. Don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. And, and the writer of this um, sermon or letter um, is saying to us, look at Jesus, your older brother, Savior. All right? So um, as we get to reading the actual text, let me just say this. For us, Older brother may not be a good picture. I mean, you may say to me, Fricky, this is not a good picture for me. I had an older brother who always gave me wedgies, and he was actually bad. And I don't want to remember all that. You know, Maybe you were that older brother. I don't know. Maybe you don't have an older brother. But let me just say that in the Hebrew family, they didn't have life insurance like we do and policies. So the oldest son or the older brother was often given a double inheritance, and it was understood that he would take the place of the father and lead the family and look after the rest of the family. So it was a very honored position. So when the Hebrew audience hears this message, Jesus is your older brother, Savior, they go, got it. When we hear it, we may go, oh, that sounds a little weird. But uh, try to think, put yourself in this context. Um, as you hear this. So our reading is from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. It'll be on the screen. And let me warn you, the first half, um, the writer or the preacher, he assumes that his audience knows the Old Testament really well, and he throws in three quotes. He quotes from Psalm 8, Psalm 22, and Isaiah 8. And so it feels a little jumbled for us if we don't really know those psalms, right? Um, and so what he's doing is he's laying down a theology for Jesus, the older brother, Savior, which is a picture in the Old Testament as well. He's trying to show them, hey, guys, throughout Scripture, Jesus actually, the messenger of God, would be an older brother, Savior to you. And so he's giving them the theology out of their Bible. So we're going to read through it. It may sound a little confusing. Who's he talking about? What he's basically saying is uh, mankind was made lower than the angels, and he, was, he and she were called to rule creation, but they haven't. But this older brother, Savior, comes, becomes part of mankind, lower than the angels, even though he created the worlds, and he brings rulership. He brings the culmination of what God had intended for man. So that's what the first part of the reading is all about. And then the second part, well, he brings application. What does it look like? And I think we're going to be able to connect to that second part. So here we go. Hebrews 2.5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, quote, What is man? that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection under his feet, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him 
who for a little while, this is now Jesus, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things existed, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, quote, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, quote, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Now, here comes the second part, which we're hoping to connect to. Verse 14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. By the way, the word propitiation simply means to make an appeasement. If you blow it and you don't let the dog out and he messes on the carpet and chews up the curtains and everything, the way you make propitiation is bring your wife flowers and chocolate, okay? And you turn away wrath that way. That's basically what propitiation means, but obviously at a much deeper level in the scripture. So this idea of Jesus being the older brother savior and uh, coming to be with us, and experiencing the human condition and being tempted in every way is not a, a minor theme in this letter. I mean, in chapter 4, he picks it up again and he says this, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what we're talking about is Jesus... Becoming a man and experiencing everything you and I experience. Now, that, that is a pretty crazy thought if you really think about it. Now, the, the, the early church, the first two to three hundred years of the church, after Jesus came, died, rose again, and ascended, they were trying to figure this out. How does this work? And they came up with some weird ideas, and these were very intelligent men, believe me. And one of the th theories was, well, Jesus only seemed to be human and that his human form was really just an illusion. Now, they're fancy words uh, to all of these ideas, but we're not going to get into that. Another idea was that um, the Son of God didn't really exist for all eternity. He was begotten. Therefore, he was uh, one of the creations superior to the rest of creation, but he was also a created being. Then there was a theory that Jesus was actually two persons. He was uh, God and man, two persons, somehow, in one body. But none of these worked. I mean, and they finally came to this idea that Jesus was 100% God, 100% man, 
and that the union of these two natures didn't diminish each other or mixed in some sort of a strange cocktail. Now, I know that bends your mind. It does mine too. But Paul actually gives us a glimpse of what this looks like in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. He's talking about Jesus, and he says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Jesus was equal with God. He had to be God to be equal with God, right? And then he says, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. So although he was 100% God, he emptied himself of his godness. And he completely took on the form of man. Now, this is important. I don't want you to glaze over and go, oh, boy, I didn't know I was going to be in Bible school this morning. But this has massive implications for us, if you'll just hang with me. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. So he went where very few uh, human beings went, which was death by crucifixion, which was reserved for the worst of the worst considered people. And the crazy thing is he did it by choice. So I think he stands in a league of his own. Anyway, so what does this mean? I'll go back to two texts we've read recently. Hebrews 2.18 for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He knows what you're talking about. Jesus doesn't just know what he's talking about. He knows what you're talking about. And then, of course, Hebrews 4, beg your pardon. But Jesus is able to sympathize with our weakness one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now you may go, ha, ha hold on. So Jesus was without sin, and yet he was tempted in every way? That kind of sounds a little like a bulletproof vest. Like the shots he's taking, they don't feel like the shots I take, and I know others take. Well, firstly, one of the classic examples in Scripture of Jesus being tempted was in the wilderness for 40 days. And I don't know what you imagine with uh, that picture. But, you know, I used to think, well, Jesus camped out in the wilderness for 40 days. And maybe on the 40th day, the devil came to him and went, hey, three questions for you. Um, why don't you turn uh, these stones into uh, McDonald's Egg McMuffins? Wouldn't that be good? You know? Or throw yourself off this high place and the angels save you. Or fall down and worship me, I'll give you everything. No, I believe it was 40 days of relentless pounding as the devil took his best shots at Jesus. And in fact, I would argue that Jesus was tempted throughout his life on earth. C.S. Lewis says this, an English author who's dead now, Christian author, he says, if temptation is a very strong wind, and Jesus walked in the same storm we did, and he never fell, but we fall. Think about it. You find temporary relief when you fall. The wind doesn't blow as hard against you. But if you never fall, you consistently feel that wind pushing against you. Jesus faced more temptation than any of you because he never fell. He stood in the wind for 33 and a half years. He saw it all, the same wind you and I stand in. But I want you to think about this idea of Jesus coming to earth. God, who created the worlds, Jesus created the world, um, and he comes to man for man to be killed by man to save men. God moved into the most dangerous neighborhood in the universe called planet Earth. 
and he took up residency there, knowing his life would be continually at risk. And think about it. He comes to this dusty little village in the Middle East, where our friends are. He's born in a low-income family. He's got half-brothers and sisters who mock him a lot. It was a huge disgrace, being an illegitimate child. He was born... And the dates of when Mary and Joseph were married and his age didn't match. Do you think people didn't know that? And he worked in a dusty little workshop with no air conditioning. And he made furniture for people who often complained that it wasn't just quite right and some of them didn't pay their bills. <laughs> it, it actually, when you think about it, it, it actually blows your mind. Who is this God who wants to be with us and wants to be human. And all we want to be is not human. We, we want to be superhuman. We just want to get out of here. It's crazy. It's kind of like the firefighters who were running into the 9-11 buildings when everyone else was running out. Why would you want to do that? Well, we know why they did it. But we also know why he did it. And it's because he loved us. He's committed to us. He didn't just take uh, the earth when uh, Adam and Eve sinned and kicked it like a little dirty tennis ball out into the big field of the universe. I'm done. Boom. Oops. That really was a kick. I'm a soccer player. Well, I used to be. So I get very enthusiastic when I kick. But this is, there, there's three reasons why I think it's important that we grasp this truth of the incarnation, God in the flesh. The first one is, it affects how we live before God. Thomas Keating, one of the writers that I love, writes in his book, The Stages of Contemplative Living, when we feel far from God and abandoned, we can know that we're actually close to Jesus. If there's anybody who knows what it's like to be completely alone in the world, naked with nothing, it's Jesus. And on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you've ever felt alone or abandoned, Jesus is your man. Jesus is your older brother, Savior. Jesus put a face, hands and feet on God. We would, we would only sit with uh, one of the Psalms quoted in, in, in chapter 1. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you would even consider him? That would be our only view of God. It's like, but we have Jesus. I think we struggle and we can see our struggle with really grasping this in our prayers. Oftentimes when we pray, it sounds like we're trying to explain to God what we're going through. No, he already knows that. He's sharing it with you. And this is the kicker. Jesus is not like a buddy who went through a really difficult experience in 1987. And he goes, yeah, being there was tough. No. He actually decided to go through that thing again with you. He eternally goes, listen to this, Hebrews 2.18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He's in that temptation with you. Many of us think when we're being tempted, God looks away. Oh, I can't handle it. <laughs> Listen, man, God has seen it all. Jesus saw it all. Jesus felt it all. He's not. That's the beautiful thing. He's right there with you. Oh, but when you sin... When you break the limit, speed limit, God gets out the car. No, he doesn't. God's not afraid of high speeds. He's not afraid of your rebellion. He isn't. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 29. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. 
This is the only text where Jesus openly describes how he thinks and how he feels. I am gentle and lowly at heart. So it affects how we live before God. I think understanding the incarnation, God in the flesh, second thing is how we live in our own bodies. Now, most of us have issues with our body. We either worship it or we hate it, or both in the same day, right? I love what Henry Nouwen, another writer that I love, writes about Christian leadership. He's writing to ministers and priests, but I believe that it pertains to all believers. When ministers and priests live their ministry mostly in their heads and relate to the gospel as a set of valuable ideas to be announced, the body quickly takes revenge by screaming loudly for affection and intimacy. Christian leaders are called to live the incarnation, that is to live in the body, and not only in their physical bodies, but also in the corporate body of the community and to discover the presence of the Holy Spirit there. This is so powerful. This last weekend, um, I had the, uh, just the joy of going dirt biking with four guys in the church. Now, we're not going to mention names because we do want to protect the guilty. But whenever you get a bunch of guys out in the bush around a campfire, and they've been riding dirt bikes all day, and you hear some strange sounds and some really strange smells. And you hear stories exaggerated and retold, and the story's better than the event, you know, by the end of the night. Do you think none of that happened when Jesus was out traveling with his disciples? When they were sitting around the campfire? When they had just washed in the river? Don't you think they cut up and laughed? Or do you think Jesus had his own separate tent 200 yards away? It was the white tent. <laughs> Everyone else was in camo tents. I mean, just think about it. It helps me think, am I more holier right now than I was last weekend with all the smells and the noises, the silly jokes? Have I stepped into a new realm or am I still in my body and in the community? Isn't this God in the flesh? I love the Jesus movies. Some of them are not done well. But you look at the set and they're all these sort of Middle Eastern looking, third world kind of people. They're dirty. They're wearing funny clothes. And somewhere in the movie, out walks this guy who... Looks like he's a Californian surfer. He's six foot two. His hair is beautifully groomed. He's Jesus, right? And uh, he's the only one who can afford bleach. So he's got the nicest, whitest garment. Isaiah 53 says, There was nothing beautiful about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. I don't know about being described like that. Imagine if someone said to you, you've got to meet Fricky, man. He's nothing to look at, and there's nothing really that will attract you to him. But you, you need to talk to him. That was Jesus. We learn to live in our bodies well, not worshipping them, not despising them. And we learn to live together in the messiness because that's where Jesus lived. And I think the third thing, and I'm going to finish here, is we learn to live in the world. We learn to live before God. We learn to live before one and uh, we learn to live before one another in the flesh, in our bodies. But we learn to live in the world. Jesus died, rose again, and before he ascended, in John chapter two, he says this: On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said. Peace be with you. Let me tell you, when you're in a locked room and someone walks in, you get scared spitless, right? Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands inside. 
They touched him. He was touchable. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, peace, again, peace be with you. This is the part I want you to notice. As the Father sent me, even so send I you. How did the Father send Jesus? Well, that's what we've been talking about. Older brother, Savior, in the flesh, incarnate, experiencing humbly, lowly in heart. That's how I want you to go. I don't want you to go to work tomorrow morning. Like, I want you to be you. I want you to be human. I want you to be a lover of Jesus. What you do outside is what you do inside. That's who I want you to be. Normal. Wonderfully, wonderfully normal and ordinary. Right? As the Father sent me. So, sinner, and then it says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Spirit. He wants us to go in the Spirit. He wants us to be led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. Some of us don't realize what that means. We struggle with it. We look at Jesus and we think he could see round corners when he walked on the earth. He had a bulletproof vest. I take the story, for example, in Luke chapter 8, where Jesus is in a crowd. They're pressing on him. There's this woman who's had a 12-year, people think, menstrual cycle. She has bled for 12 years. In that culture, when women were menstruating, they were considered unclean and you weren't to touch them. So for 12 years, she was untouchable. And she's lived in isolation. And she says, if I can only touch the hem of his garment. And she somehow works her way through incognito. And she touches the hem of his garment. And he stops. And he said, who touched me? Peter goes, Lord, what are you talking about? We're in a crowded place. Jesus said, no, no. I felt virtue flow from me. Now, I've actually sat in small groups with people talking about this Jesus story. And some of them have said to me, yeah, Jesus knew. He knew what was going to happen. And he knew who she was. Well, then I say, well, how come he turns around and goes, who touched me? Well, Jesus was just testing her. Testing her faith. I'm like, really? You've just stripped that story of the heart of Jesus and who he is and who she was. No, I think he turned and he felt something flowing out of her, out of him, so that what was flowing out of her was dried up. And she became clean as he felt dirtied. And when he goes, who touched me? Genuinely, just being led by the Spirit. I don't know who touched me. I know somebody touched me. She steps forward and she steps out of the isolation and the shame as she realizes, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. If Jesus wasn't led by the Spirit and he just knew everything that was going to happen, how are we expected to live this life, this Spirit-led as the Father sent me, so send I you go in the Spirit. How are we meant to do it if he didn't do it? And we strip the Bible of its beauty and its richness, and it becomes wooden and cold. No, my friend, Jesus, older brother, Savior, still older brother, Savior, but glorified older brother, Savior for you and me. So we come to the table this morning of communion. And what are we celebrating? The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. You know, some fitness fanatics and health fanatics say, you are what you eat. I think in this case they're right. You are, you are what you eat. So if you're a believer today, under your chair, if you're in the front row and in the back, the seat row in front of you, 
we have our little communion cups. I want you to open it, and just before you consume it, just hold steady. It's going to take you about three minutes to get the wafer out if you're not a professional like me. As you take this wafer today, I want you to say, Jesus in the flesh for me. Now, as we get ready to drink the cup, I want to tell you, Jesus is not just saying, I feel you, man. I feel you. He's saying, I bled out for you. This is deep, if you can believe it. As we take the cup, I want you to just say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood shed for me. Father, I'm praying today that those of us who feel discouraged, your warning is, look at Jesus, older brother, Savior. Don't harden your heart. Be encouraged. I pray that courage and comfort would flow into your people today in Jesus' name. Will you bring strength and healing that only you can bring? Amen.
war with pain. We'll see, Lord, and then as there gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory. first time this morning, we would love to meet you in the flesh, um, and uh, because it's raining outside, the way we'd love to do it is in that back corner, we're going to have a couple of our leaders there, um, Scott and Mark, and, and um, I mean Clark and Mark, sorry, and um, you're going to be able to talk to them and they get to know you a little. If it's your second time, we have a little gift for you. Um, we also have uh, leaders and part of our prayer team that are going to be down here to pray with you. I want to encourage you to live in the body well, your body, the church body. Don't go it alone. You weren't designed for it. Jesus didn't do it. Come, someone will pray with you. We'll pray together. When you leave, we exit out the side doors. Uh, there are little um, buckets for those of us who want to give. We give because God is good and His mission is great in the world. If you have children, you're going to need to go out the back door to collect them. And guys, it's really been good being with you today. We have six days to make disciples, push back darkness, all for the sake of the gospel. God bless you.